Good evening, and welcome to Boring Books for Bedtime. I hope tonight's installment provides all the boredom your busy brain needs to quiet down and let you get some sleep for once. So lie back, adjust your volume, take a nice deep breath, and off we go. Tonight we're relaxing with a work of philosophy, time and free will, an essay on the immediate data of consciousness by Henri Bergson, member of the Institute, professor at the Collège de France, authorized translation by F. L. Pogson, M. A., published in London by George Allen and Company, Limited, and in New York by the Macmillan Company, 1913. Let's begin. Translator's Preface Henri-Louis Bergson was born in Paris, October 18, 1859. He entered the École Normale in 1878 and was admitted Agrégé de Philosophie in 1881 and Docteur des Lettres in 1889. After holding professorships in various provincial and Parisian lycées, he became maître de conférence at the École Normale Supérieure in 1897, and since 1900 has been professor at the Collège de France. In 1901, he became a member of the Institute on his election to the Académie des Sciences Morale et Politique. A full list of Professor Bergson's works is given in the appended bibliography. In making the following translation of his Essai sur les données immédiates de la conscience, I have had the great advantage of his cooperation at every stage, and the aid which he has given has been most generous and untiring. The book itself was worked out and written during the years 1883 to 1887, and was originally published in 1889. The footnotes in the French edition contain a certain number of references to French translations of English works. In the present translation, I am responsible for citing these references from the original English this will account for the fact that editions are sometimes referred to which have appeared subsequently to 1889. I have also added fairly extensive marginal summaries and a full index. In France, the essay is already in its seventh edition. Indeed, one of the most striking facts about Professor Bergson's works is the extent to which they have appealed not only to the professional philosophers, but also to the ordinary cultivated public. The method which he pursues is not the conceptual and abstract method, which has been the dominant tradition in philosophy. For him, reality is not to be reached by any elaborate construction of thought, it is given in immediate experience as a flux, a continuous process of becoming, to be grasped by intuition, by sympathetic insight. Concepts break up the continuous flow of reality into parts external to one another. They further the interests of language and social life and are useful primarily for practical purposes. But they give us nothing of the life and movement of reality. Rather, by substituting for this an artificial reconstruction, a patchwork of dead fragments, they lead to the difficulties which have always beset the intellectualist philosophy.
and which on its premises are insoluble. Instead of attempting a solution in the intellectualist sense, Professor Bergson calls upon his readers to put these broken fragments of reality behind them, to immerse themselves in the living stream of things, and to find their difficulties swept away in its resistless flow. In the present volume, Professor Bergson first deals with the intensity of conscious states. He shows that quantitative differences are applicable only to magnitudes, that is, in the last resort, to space, and that intensity in itself is purely qualitative. Passing then from the consideration of separate conscious states to their multiplicity, he finds that there are two forms of multiplicity. Quantitative or discrete multiplicity involves the intuition of space, but the multiplicity of conscious states is wholly qualitative. This unfolding multiplicity constitutes duration, which is a succession without distinction, an interpenetration of elements so heterogeneous that former states can never recur. The idea of a homogeneous and measurable time is shown to be an artificial concept, formed by the intrusion of the idea of space into the realm of pure duration. Indeed, the whole of Professor Bergson's philosophy centers round his conception of real concrete duration and the specific feeling of duration which our consciousness has when it does away with convention and habit and gets back to its natural attitude. At the root of most errors in philosophy, he finds a confusion between this concrete duration and the abstract time which mathematics, physics, and even language and common sense substitute for it. Applying these results to the problem of free will, he shows that the difficulties arise from taking up one stand after the fact has been performed, and applying the conceptual method to it. From the point of view of the living, developing self, these difficulties are shown to be illusory, and freedom, though not definable in abstract or conceptual terms, is declared to be one of the clearest facts established by observation. It is no doubt misleading to attempt to sum up a system of philosophy in a sentence, but perhaps some part of the spirit of Professor Bergson's philosophy may be gathered from the motto which, with his permission, I have prefixed to this translation. Quote, if a man were to inquire of nature the reason of her creative activity, and if she were willing to give ear and answer, she would say, Ask me not, but understand in silence, even as I am silent, and am not wont to speak." End quote. F. L. Pogson, Oxford, June 1910 Author's Preface We necessarily express ourselves by means of words and we usually think in terms of space. That is to say, language requires us to establish between our ideas the same sharp and precise distinctions, the same discontinuity as between material objects. This assimilation of thought to things is useful in practical life and necessary in most of the sciences. But it may be asked whether the insurmountable difficulties presented by certain philosophical problems 
do not arise from our placing side by side in space phenomena which do not occupy space, and whether by merely getting rid of the clumsy symbols round which we are fighting, we might not bring the fight to an end. When an illegitimate translation of the unextended into the extended, of quality into quantity, has introduced contradiction into the very heart of the question, contradiction must, of course, recur in the answer. The problem which I have chosen is one which is common to metaphysics and psychology, the problem of free will. What I attempt to prove is that all discussion between the determinists and their opponents implies a previous confusion of duration with extensity, of succession with simultaneity, of quality with quantity. This confusion once dispelled, we may perhaps witness the disappearance of the objections raised against free will, of the definitions given of it, and in a certain sense, of the problem of free will itself. To prove this is the object of the third part of the present volume. The first two chapters, which treat of the conceptions of intensity and duration, have been written as an introduction to the third. Henri Bergson, February 1888 Chapter 1 The Intensity of Psychic States It is usually admitted that states of consciousness, sensations, feelings, passions, efforts, are capable of growth and diminution. We are even told that a sensation can be said to be twice, thrice, four times as intense as another sensation of the same kind. This latter thesis, which is maintained by psychophysicists, we shall examine later. But even the opponents of psychophysics do not see any harm in speaking of one sensation as being more intense than another, of one effort as being greater than another and in thus setting up differences of quantity between purely internal states. Common sense, moreover, has not the slightest hesitation in giving its verdict on this point. People say they are more or less warm, or more or less sad, and this distinction of more or less even when it is carried over to the region of subjective facts and unextended objects, surprises nobody. But this involves a very obscure point, and a much more important problem than is usually supposed. When we assert that one number is greater than another number, or one body greater than another body, we know very well what we mean. For in both cases we allude to unequal spaces, as shall be shown in detail a little further on, and we call that space the greater which contains the other. But how can a more intense sensation contain one of less intensity? Shall we say that the first implies the second? that we reach the sensation of higher intensity only on condition of having first passed through the less intense stages of the same sensation, and that in a certain sense we are concerned here also with the relation of container to contained. This conception of intensive magnitude seems indeed to be that of common sense but we cannot advance it as a philosophical explanation without becoming involved in a vicious circle 
for it is beyond doubt that in the natural series of numbers, the later number exceeds the earlier. But the very possibility of arranging the numbers in ascending order arises from their having to each other relations of container and contained, so that we feel ourselves able to explain precisely in what sense one is greater than the other. The question then is how we succeed in forming a series of this kind with intensities which cannot be superposed on each other, and by what sign we recognize that the numbers of this series increase, for example, instead of diminishing. But this always comes back to the inquiry why an intensity can be assimilated to a magnitude. It is only to evade the difficulty to distinguish, as is usually done, between two species of quantity, the first extensive and measurable, the second intensive and not admitting of measure, but of which it can nevertheless be said that it is greater or less than another intensity. For it is recognized thereby that there is something common to these two forms of magnitude, since they are both termed magnitudes and declared to be equally capable of increase and diminution. But from the point of view of magnitude, what can there be in common between the extensive and the intensive, the extended and the unextended? If in the first case we call that which contains the other the greater quantity, why go on speaking of quantity and magnitude when there is no longer a container or a contained? If a quantity can increase and diminish, if we perceive in it, so to speak, the less inside the more, is not such a quantity on this very account divisible and thereby extended? Is it not then a contradiction to speak of an inextensive quantity, but yet common sense agrees with the philosophers in setting up a pure intensity as a magnitude, just as if it were something extended? And not only do we use the same word, but whether we think of a greater intensity or a greater extensity, we experience in both cases an analogous impression. The terms greater and less call up in both cases the same idea. If we now ask ourselves in what does this idea consist? Our consciousness still offers us the image of a container and a contained. We picture to ourselves, for example, a greater intensity of effort as a greater length of thread rolled up, or as a spring which, in unwinding, will occupy a greater space. In the idea of intensity, and even in the word which expresses it, we shall find the image of a present contraction and consequently a future expansion, the image of something virtually extended, and if we may say so, of a compressed space. We are thus led to believe that we translate the intensive into the extensive and that we compare two intensities, or at least express the comparison by the confused intuition of a relation between two extensities. But it is just the nature of this operation which it is difficult to determine. The solution which occurs immediately to the mind, once it has entered upon this path, consists in defining the intensity of a sensation, or of any state whatever of the ego, by the number and magnitude of the objective and therefore measurable 
causes which have given rise to it. Doubtless a more intense sensation of light is the one which has been obtained or is obtainable by means of a larger number of luminous sources, provided they be at the same distance and identical with one another. But in the immense majority of cases, we decide about the intensity of the effect without even knowing the nature of the cause, much less its magnitude. Indeed, it is the very intensity of the effect which often leads us to venture a hypothesis as to the number and nature of the causes, and thus to revise the judgment of our senses, which at first represented them as insignificant. And it is no use arguing that we are then comparing the actual state of the ego with some previous state in which the cause was perceived in its entirety at the same time as its effect was experienced. No doubt this is our procedure in a fairly large number of cases, but we cannot then explain the differences of intensity which we recognize between deep-seated psychic phenomena, the cause of which is within us and not outside. On the other hand, we are never so bold in judging the intensity of a psychic state as when the subjective aspect of the phenomenon is the only one to strike us, or when the external cause to which we refer it does not easily admit of measurement. Thus it seems evident that we experience a more intense pain at the pulling out of a tooth than of a hair. The artist knows without the possibility of doubt that the picture of a master affords him more intense pleasure than the signboard of a shop, and there is not the slightest need ever to have heard of forces of cohesion to assert that we expend less effort in bending a steel blade than a bar of iron. Thus the comparison of two intensities is usually made without the least appreciation of the number of causes, their mode of action, or their extent. There is still room, it is true, for hypothesis of the same nature, but more subtle. We know that mechanical and especially kinetic theories aim at explaining the visible and sensible properties of bodies by well-defined movements of their ultimate parts. And many of us foresee the time when the intensive differences of qualities, that is to say, of our sensations, will be reduced to extensive differences between the changes taking place behind them. May it not be maintained that, without knowing these theories, we have a vague surmise of them, that behind the more intense sound we guess the presence of ampler vibrations which are propagated in the disturbed medium, and that it is with a reference to this mathematical relation, precise in itself though confusedly perceived, that we assert the higher intensity of a particular sound. Without even going so far, could it not be laid down that every state of consciousness corresponds to a certain disturbance of the molecules and atoms of the cerebral substance, and that the intensity of a sensation measures the amplitude, the complication, or the extent of these molecular movements. This last hypothesis is at least as probable as the other, but it no more solves the problem, for quite possibly the intensity of a sensation bears witness to a more or less considerable work accomplished in our organism.
but it is the sensation which is given to us in consciousness and not this mechanical work. Indeed, it is by the intensity of the sensation that we judge of the greater or less amount of work accomplished. Intensity then remains, at least apparently, a property of sensation. And still, the same question recurs. Why do we say of a higher intensity that it is greater? Why do we think of a greater quantity or a greater space? Perhaps the difficulty of the problem lies chiefly in the fact that we call by the same name and picture to ourselves in the same way intensities which are very different in nature, e.g. the intensity of a feeling and that of a sensation or an effort. The effort is accomplished by a muscular sensation and the sensations themselves are connected with certain physical conditions, which probably count for something in the estimate of their intensity. We have here to do with phenomena which take place on the surface of consciousness, and which are always connected, as we shall see further on, with the perception of a movement or of an external object. But certain states of the soul seem to us, rightly or wrongly, to be self-sufficient, such as deep joy or sorrow, a reflective passion or an aesthetic emotion. Pure intensity ought to be more easily definable in these simple cases, where no extensive element seems to be involved. We shall see, in fact, that it is reducible here to a certain quality or shade which spreads over a more or less considerable mass of psychic states, or, if the expression be preferred, to the larger or smaller number of simple states which make up the fundamental emotion. For example, an obscure desire gradually becomes a deep passion. Now, you will see that the feeble intensity of this desire consisted at first in its appearing to be isolated, and as it were, foreign to the remainder of your inner life. But little by little it permeates a larger number of psychic elements tinging them, so to speak, with its own color, and lo, your outlook on the whole of your surroundings seems now to have changed radically. How do you become aware of a deep passion once it has taken hold of you, if not by perceiving that the same objects no longer impress you in the same manner? All your sensations, and all your ideas seem to brighten up. It is like childhood back again. We experience something of the kind in certain dreams, in which we do not imagine anything out of the ordinary, and yet through which there resounds an indescribable note of originality. The fact is that, the further we penetrate into the depths of consciousness, the less right we have to treat psychic phenomena as things which are set side by side. When it is said that an object occupies a large space in the soul, or even that it fills it entirely, we ought to understand by this simply that its image has altered the shade of a thousand perceptions or memories, and that in this sense it pervades them, although it does not itself come into view. But this wholly dynamic way of looking at things is repugnant to the reflective consciousness, 
because the latter delights in clean-cut distinctions, which are easily expressed in words, and in things with well-defined outlines, like those which are perceived in space. It will assume then that everything else remaining identical, such and such a desire has gone up a scale of magnitudes, as though it were permissible still to speak of magnitude, where there is neither multiplicity nor space. But just as consciousness, as will be shown later on, concentrates on a given point of an organism the increasing number of muscular contractions which take place on the surface of the body, thus converting them into one single feeling of effort, of growing intensity. So it will hypostatize under the form of a growing desire the gradual alterations which take place in the confused heap of coexisting psychic states. But that is a change of quality, rather than of magnitude. What makes hope such an intense pleasure is the fact that the future, which we dispose of to our liking, appears to us at the same time under a multitude of forms, equally attractive and equally possible. Even if the most coveted of these becomes realized, it will be necessary to give up the others, and we shall have lost a great deal. The idea of the future, pregnant with an infinity of possibilities, is thus more fruitful than the future itself. And that is why we find more charm in hope than in possession, in dreams than in reality. Let us try to discover the nature of an increasing intensity of joy or sorrow in the exceptional cases where no physical symptom intervenes. Neither inner joy nor passion is an isolated inner state which at first occupies a corner of the soul and gradually spreads. At its lowest level, it is very like a turning of our states of consciousness towards the future. Then, as if their weight were diminished by this attraction, our ideas and sensations succeed one another with greater rapidity. Our movements no longer cost us the same effort. Finally, in cases of extreme joy, our perceptions and memories become tinged with an indefinable quality, as with a kind of heat or light, so novel that now and then, as we stare at our own self, we wonder how it can really exist. Thus, there are several characteristic forms of purely inward joy, all of which are successive stages corresponding to qualitative alterations in the whole of our psychic states. But the number of states which are concerned with each of these alterations is more or less considerable, and without explicitly counting them, we know very well whether, for example, our joy pervades all the impressions which we receive in the course of the day, or whether any escape from its influence. We thus set up points of division in the interval which separates two successive forms of joy, and this gradual transition from one to the other makes them appear in their turn as different intensities of one and the same feeling, which is thus supposed to change in magnitude. It could be easily shown that the different degrees of sorrow also correspond to qualitative changes. Sorrow begins by being nothing more than a facing towards the past, an impoverishment of our own sensations and ideas, as if each of them were now contained entirely 
in the little which it gives out, as if the future were in some way stopped up, and it ends with an impression of crushing failure, the effect of which is that we aspire to nothingness, while every new misfortune, by making us understand better the uselessness of the struggle, causes us a bitter pleasure. The aesthetic feelings offer us a still more striking example of this progressive stepping in of new elements, which can be detected in the fundamental emotion, and which seem to increase its magnitude, although in reality they do nothing more than alter its nature. Let us consider the simplest of them, the feeling of grace. At first, it is only the perception of a certain ease, a certain facility in the outward movements. And as those movements are easy, which prepare the way for others, we are led to find a superior ease in the movements which can be foreseen, in the present attitudes in which future attitudes are pointed out, and as it were, prefigured. If jerky movements are wanting in grace, the reason is that each of them is self-sufficient and does not announce those which are to follow. If curves are more graceful than broken lines, the reason is that, while a curved line changes its direction at every moment, every new direction is indicated in the preceding one. Thus, the perception of ease in motion passes over into the pleasure of mastering the flow of time and of holding the future in the present. A third element comes in when the graceful movements submit to a rhythm and are accompanied by music. For the rhythm and measure by allowing us to foresee to a still greater extent the movements of the dancer, make us believe that we now control them. As we guess almost the exact attitude which the dancer is going to take, he seems to obey us when he really takes it. The regularity of the rhythm establishes a kind of communication between him and us and the periodic returns of the measure are like so many invisible threads by means of which we set in motion this imaginary puppet. Indeed, if it stops for an instant, our hand in its impatience cannot refrain from making a movement as though to push it, as though to replace it in the midst of this movement the rhythm of which has taken complete possession of our thought and will. Thus a kind of physical sympathy enters into the feeling of grace. Now in analyzing the charm of this sympathy, you will find that it pleases you through its affinity with moral sympathy, the idea of which it subtly suggests. This last element in which the others are merged after having in a measure ushered it in, explains the irresistible attractiveness of grace. We could hardly make out why it affords us such pleasure if it were nothing but a saving of effort, as Spencer maintains. But the truth is that in anything which we call very graceful, we imagine ourselves able to detect besides the likeness which is a sign of mobility, some suggestion of a possible movement towards ourselves, of a virtual and even nascent sympathy. It is this mobile sympathy, always ready to offer itself, which is just the essence of higher grace. Thus, the increasing intensities of aesthetic feeling are here resolved into as many different feelings 
each one of which, already heralded by its predecessor, becomes perceptible in it, and then completely eclipses it. It is this qualitative progress which we interpret as a change of magnitude, because we like simple thoughts, and because our language is ill-suited to render the subtleties of psychological analysis. To understand how the feeling of the beautiful itself admits of degrees, we should have to submit it to a minute analysis. Perhaps the difficulty which we experience in defining, it is largely owing to the fact that we look upon the beauties of nature as anterior to those of art. The processes of art are thus supposed to be nothing more than means by which the artist expresses the beautiful, and the essence of the beautiful remains unexplained. But we might ask ourselves whether nature is beautiful otherwise than through meeting by chance certain processes of our art, and whether, in a certain sense, art is not prior to nature. Without even going so far, it seems more in conformity with the rules of a sound method to study the beautiful first in the works in which it has been produced by a conscious effort, and then to pass on by imperceptible steps from art to nature, which may be looked upon as an artist in its own way. By placing ourselves at this point of view, we shall perceive that the object of art is to put to sleep the active or rather resistant powers of our personality and thus to bring us into a state of perfect responsiveness, in which we realize the idea that is suggested to us, and sympathize with the feeling that is expressed. In the processes of art we shall find, in a weakened form, a refined and in some measure spiritualized version of the processes commonly used to induce the state of hypnosis. Thus in music, the rhythm and measure suspend the normal flow of our sensations and ideas by causing our attention to swing to and fro between fixed points, and they take hold of us with such force that even the faintest imitation of a groan will suffice to fill us with the utmost sadness. If musical sounds affect us more powerfully than the sounds of nature, the reason is that nature confines itself to expressing feelings, whereas music suggests them to us. Whence indeed comes the charm of poetry? The poet is he with whom feelings develop into images and the images themselves into words which translate them, while obeying the laws of rhythm. In seeing these images pass before our eyes, we in our turn experience the feeling which was, so to speak, their emotional equivalent. But we should never realize these images so strongly without the regular movements of the rhythm by which our soul is lulled into self-forgetfulness, and as in a dream, thinks and sees with the poet. The plastic arts obtain an effect of the same kind by the fixity with which they suddenly impose upon life, and which a physical contagion carries over to the attention of the spectator. While the works of ancient sculpture express faint emotions which play upon them like a passing breath, the pale immobility of the stone causes the feeling expressed, or the movement just begun, to appear as if they were fixed forever, absorbing our thought and our will in their own eternity.
we find in architecture, in the very midst of this startling immobility, certain effects analogous to those of rhythm. The symmetry of form, the indefinite repetition of the same architectural motif, causes our faculty of perception to oscillate between the same and the same again, and gets rid of those customary incessant changes which in ordinary life bring us back without ceasing to the consciousness of our personality. Even the faint suggestion of an idea will then be enough to make the idea fill the whole of our mind. Thus art aims at impressing feelings on us rather than expressing them. It suggests them to us and willingly dispenses with the imitation of nature when it finds some more efficacious means. Nature, like art, proceeds by suggestion, but does not command the resources of rhythm. It supplies the deficiency by the long comradeship, based on influences received in common by nature and by ourselves of which the effect is that the slightest indication by nature of a feeling arouses sympathy in our minds. Just as a mere gesture on the part of the hypnotist is enough to force the intended suggestion upon a subject accustomed to his control. And this sympathy is shown in particular when nature displays to us beings of normal proportions so that our attention is distributed equally over all the parts of the figure without being fixed on any one of them. Our perceptive faculty then finds itself lulled and soothed by this harmony, and nothing hinders any longer the free play of sympathy, which is ever ready to come forward as soon as the obstacle in its path is removed. It follows from this analysis that the feeling of the beautiful is no specific feeling, but that every feeling experienced by us will assume an aesthetic character, provided that it has been suggested and not caused. It will now be understood why the aesthetic emotion seems to us to admit of degrees of intensity and also of degrees of elevation. Sometimes the feeling which is suggested scarcely makes a break in the compact texture of psychic phenomena of which our history consists. Sometimes it draws our attention from them, but not so that they become lost to sight. Sometimes finally it puts itself in their place engrosses us and completely monopolizes our soul. There are thus distinct phases in the progress of an aesthetic feeling, as in the state of hypnosis. And these phases correspond less to variations of degree than to differences of state or of nature. But the merit of a work of art is not measured so much by the power with which the suggested feeling takes hold of us, as by the richness of this feeling itself. In other words, besides degrees of intensity, we instinctively distinguish degrees of depth or elevation. If this last concept be analyzed, it will be seen that the feelings and thoughts which the artist suggests to us express and sum up a more or less considerable part of his history. If the art which gives only sensations is an inferior art, the reason is that analysis often fails to discover in a sensation anything beyond the sensation itself. But the greater number of emotions are instinct with a thousand sensations 
feelings or ideas which pervade them. Each one is in a state unique of its kind and indefinable, and it seems that we should have to relive the life of the subject who experiences it if we wished to grasp it in its original complexity. Yet the artist aims at giving us a share in this emotion, so rich, so personal, so novel, and at enabling us to experience what he cannot make us understand. This he will bring about by choosing, among the outward signs of his emotions, those which our body is likely to imitate mechanically, though slightly, as soon as it perceives them, so as to transport us all at once into the indefinable psychological state which called them forth. Thus will be broken down the barrier interposed by time and space between his consciousness and ours, and the richer in ideas and the more pregnant with sensations and emotions is the feeling within whose limits the artist has brought us. The deeper and the higher shall we find the beauty thus expressed. The successive intensities of the aesthetic feeling thus correspond to changes of state occurring in us, and the degrees of depth to the larger or smaller number of elementary psychic phenomena which we dimly discern in the fundamental emotion. The moral feelings may be studied in the same way. Let us take pity as an example. It consists in the first place in putting oneself mentally in the place of others, in suffering their pain. But if it were nothing more, as some have maintained, it would inspire us with the idea of avoiding the wretched rather than helping them, for pain is naturally abhorrent to us. This feeling of horror may indeed be at the root of pity, but a new element soon comes in, the need of helping our fellow men and of alleviating their suffering. Shall we say with La Rochefoucauld, that this so-called sympathy is a calculation, a shrewd insurance against evils to come. Perhaps a dread of some future evil to ourselves does hold a place in our compassion for other people's evil. These, however, are but lower forms of pity. True pity consists not so much in fearing suffering as in desiring it. The desire is a faint one, and we should hardly wish to see it realized. Yet we form it in spite of ourselves, as if nature were committing some great injustice, and it were necessary to get rid of all suspicion of complicity with her. The essence of pity is thus a need for self-abasement, an aspiration downwards. This painful aspiration nevertheless has a charm about it, because it raises us in our own estimation and makes us feel superior to those sensuous goods from which our thought is temporarily detached. The increasing intensity of pity thus consists in a qualitative progress, in a transition from repugnance to fear from fear to sympathy, and from sympathy itself to humility. And that seems as good a place as any to end this evening's reading of Time and Free Will, an essay on the immediate data of consciousness by Henri Bergson. That was quite a lot of words and I have no idea what they have to do with free will, but never mind. Hopefully you're no longer awake to hear this, but if you are and you'd like to read this work for yourself, 
you'll find a link to a free ebook version from Project Gutenberg in the show description. You'll also find a link to our Patreon page, where you can become one of a growing group of supporters who help make this podcast possible. I encourage you to check it out. If you'd like to connect, or suggest a boring book you'd like to hear read, the best place to catch me is on Twitter at BoringBooksPod. I'd love to hear from you. I'm so glad you could join me this evening. Until our next boring book, good night.